Remember the absolutely iconic sounds that made up the music for this? The classic water level in Super Mario 64 called Dire Dire Docks, and its incredible soundtrack composed by the great Koji Kondo, is a masterpiece in simplicity, ambiance, and immersion. But the thing that we probably always thought of as we were playing this and kind of just inherently felt was that it just sounds like water. What is that? Why? How can we create such immersive and suggestive sounds that leave absolutely no question in our minds that we are indeed underwater? And perhaps many of you may recognize another great example of this from the Super Nintendo. Oh man. So beautiful. Wow. Yeah, oh man. This can only adequately be described with the brilliant headline. Man tasked with making score for a monkey riding a swordfish underwater creates transcendent piece of music. And that man, of course, being the great composer, David Wise. Yeah, and there's something about these water levels that just make us feel immersed in an underwater environment. And I think we find the answer as to why in a number of different places. One of the earliest iconic examples of a water level in video games goes all the way back to the 1985 release of Super Mario Brothers for the NES. World 2-2 features an underwater Mario shooting fish with fire flowers underwater somehow. <laughs> Really interesting side note here. Notice how any time a coin is obtained, it plays the coin sound from Super Mario. But the melody of the song briefly disappears. And that's because there simply aren't enough audio channels to play all of the layers of the music and the coin sound effect at one time. And this is a perfect example of those early video game hardware limitations that we love to talk about. But as we move on to the Super Nintendo and the N64, we start to get examples like Donkey Kong Country and Super Mario 64. And listening to both of these, while different, they give us somewhat similar vibes. And there's just something about those vibes that screams water. Ah, that's such a beautiful... C minor 9, right? So we have a C minor chord with the flat 7, C minor 7, and we add the 9th. And then we just have a beautiful pad holding that chord out. And then we have this motif here. That's such a beautiful sound. Ooh, what's that one? So we start here. Ah. Ooh, really? Is that it? Ah, that's really beautiful. Wow. So we started with this C minor 9, and then we go to a... All we do is we just change the root. And when we do that, we can keep this whole structure on top because while it's a C minor 9 here, when we make it an A flat major chord, now this has a different, a different layout. It's an A major 7, but we have the 9th. But if we hang on to this note, it changes the chord a little bit. It means that we have an A major seven with a sharp 11, which is a beautiful sound. It's a very sort of uh, ethereal, almost like it has a twinge of mystery to it, which you'll find is kind of an important part about what adds to this aquatic ambiance, what, what adds to this feeling of being underwater, right? Is there's a little bit of mystery to it, just the same way that there is an insane amount of mystery in the ocean. So much so that, I don't know if you know this, but we have literally mapped more of the surface of Mars than we have of our own seafloor. The amount that we still don't know about our own oceans 
is staggering. What species might be lurking around down there? What unexplored worlds are hiding in the darkness somewhere in the vast abyss? It makes sense that a musical representation of this environment would feel very mysterious. And it's not just mysteriousness that we're hearing either. There's also like a calmness to it. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, when you put your head under the water, a few different things happen to the sound around you. Firstly, it travels four times faster than sound travels through the air. Now that's crazy, but what's really interesting is that while sound also travels much further than in the air, the high and low frequencies of a sound interact with water molecules differently depending on a number of conditions. Typically, low frequencies of a sound have a much easier time traveling incredibly long distances whereas the higher frequencies tend to die off quicker. And by the time the sound reaches you, you may only be hearing what sounds like a, like a distant muffled echo of what it once was. It's like putting a sound through a low pass filter. That sounds like this. Almost sounds like we're kind of submerging our heads under the water, right? And that can kind of give us that sense of calmness as well. And so in terms of what instruments we might want to use to emulate that feel, I mean, it makes sense that we would want to go for things that have more of like a, a slightly muffled timbre even. Softer and more rounded edges. And that's exactly what we hear. The quality of the sound here, right? There's a few different things going on. Oh, that slow rising note there. That real, did you hear that? way up top, it ends up ends up, up there, right? And that kind of slide of, I feel like it just adds to the mystery. That's a, such a beautiful melody over the, oh, over that A flat major seven sharp 11 chord, we have, What a beautiful way to fill out that chord with a melody. You know, and it's an interesting uh, example of something where like, we have the chord that's being held out, but because all of those notes in that melody work really well in that A flat major seven sharp 11 chord, we, you could just hold down the sustain pedal on the piano and let all of those notes ring. and none of them are gonna conflict with each other because they all work so well with this beautiful chord. Ah, now they're... Woo oh man, and there's, there's a couple other things going on here too. So we had a couple new chords there. We had an F. Minor 11, that's a beautiful chord as well. And then we have this gorgeous, I felt a lot like a B flat major chord, but with with the D in the bass, with its third in the bass, behave. So we have, oh, beautiful. And then before it goes back to that C minor nine chord. Oh, and we get this really cool beat going on. Now there's something that's happening with all of these instruments that I think really aids in this feeling of being underwater in this mysterious environment. You know, and whether it's because of how underwater environments are depicted in artistic representations like films and video games, or whether it's because of how those underwater environments actually sound in real life, we imagine the underwater world to be sort of echoey. And there's three sound effects that we might associate with these underwater sounds. Echo, reverb, and delay. And they're all uniquely different from each other. Echo is when sound waves bounce off of something and return to us, and usually it sounds quieter upon its return because the sound has dissipated a little bit. Delay is very similar to echo, it's just that we add more parameters that we can control, like how fast the sound repeats itself and how quickly it decays or gets quieter. And so you could think of it like echo is actually a form of delay. And reverb is simply the sound of all of the sound waves kind of bouncing around in different directions inside a given space. It's kind of how we always imagine the sound of the underwater environment to be. And there's a few things that in real life that I think give us that feel. When we think of animals in the water, 
dolphins, whales, things that make, that have like an underwater call that we can hear. It's often depicted in a kind of echoey manner. How about the ping of sonar? I mean, that's like the quintessential sound that we associate with underwater environments, especially in films and stuff like that. Now, in artistic representations, we typically represent the sound of sonar with this. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but that's actually not really what sonar sounds like. Something called active sonar, in reality, sounds more like this. It's incredibly loud underwater, and technically speaking, it uh, can kill you. But still, it has sort of an echoey feel to us, and that's actually how sonar works. The sound bounces off of things in the water, and it comes back to the source. And by the size and clarity of the sound, and probably a whole bunch of other things that I don't know about, they're actually able to paint a pretty clear picture of the environment around the source. And so again, it makes sense that we'd want to use instruments to kind of emulate all of that. The echo, the reverb, the delay. All of it kind of creates this sort of ethereal underwater environment. Well, we hear plenty of that in here. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's the echo. That In this case, it's like delay, right? By the way, this must be where the, uh, <laughs> the, the 007, the GoldenEye 007 sound comes from because that's kind of the same thing, just a little higher. Right there! Did you hear that? I mean, that straight up sounds like what we think of when we think of a dolphin sound or a whale sound, right? That like that's 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 literally like a whale call, is it not? Yeah, and we're really just going again. We have the C minor, A flat major, then we have the F minor. Oh man, such beautiful chords. Just such an absolutely gorgeous ambiance. And I love that it's called that because that's really what it is. And it gives us that feeling of being underwater. And if you played this game with any regularity growing up or at some point in your life, this is incredibly nostalgic for some people, very emotional. It's connected to all these amazing memories of childhood or of just an earlier time. Oh, it's so good. And so much of this we carry over when we look at the Mario 64 theme as well, even though it's applied a little bit differently. Check this out. Immediately, we can hear it's different, right? Because... We get a different feel. This is uh, perhaps maybe more major and a little less mysterious. It's a little more comforted, right? It's, it's not quite, there's not as much unknown in this theme, I don't feel like. But that classic electric piano sound, I mean, that is the sound of this level and such a synonymous sound with this game and thus such a synonymous sound with water levels. I mean, tell me that that electric piano sound doesn't just sound like water. in addition to all of the same echo reverb type of feel that we had in Donkey Kong, here we have kind of the same thing. There's an added element that I noticed right off the bat and that's like, notice there's like a shimmer. Imagine light passing through the water in a pool, on the floor of a pool, you always get that shimmer of light. Water is just very shimmery. That's what it's doing visually and we're kind of hearing that in the way that these notes are held out over top of each other. Right there, here it just has like a, Ah, it's just, it's very shimmery in the way the sustain holds out. Little bit of mystery there, right? I mean, that's so simple. We're just G major, F major, E flat major, F major. We're kind of just playing around with that right there. And it's cool because that held out thing works for all three chords. It has a different function for each chord, but it works beautifully with each one, right? Oh, what a cool melody. But man, there's, there's just so much about these sounds, literally the instrumentation, that just gives us this feeling of being underwater. And you know, these are far from the only examples of this in video game music. <laughs> the, the widely hated water level from the NES game, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, did honestly had many of the same characteristics, though applied in a different way. 
This has a totally different energy. But notice the, the sounds that we're using, the actual synthesizer quality, the timbre of these sounds. It's, it's very like, almost very kind of muffled. There's not a ton of high end. Yo! <laughs> oh man. The chromatic movement in this, oh man, this probably deserves its own video by itself because what a theme. But again, between the music and also some of the sound effects that you just heard in there, with a kind of like an echoey delay, like it just, it feels like it's underwater. And all of this begs the question, what actually is it about these soundtracks that makes us feel like they are truly immersive underwater environments? Is it the reflection of nature and reality? The sounds and the feelings of being underwater? or? Is it the fact that at some point along the way in the development of these games, we just decided this is what water sounds like? And now we just kind of all recognize it as such? And as is usually the case with these things, I think the answer is a little bit of both. Certainly we all recognize the iconic and nostalgic sounds of these underwater levels in our favorite video games. But maybe, and I think perhaps the more powerful thing, is that these composers like Koji Kondo and David Wise, they deliberately chose sounds and harmonies that were really reminiscent of the natural sounds of the ocean. And ultimately these are the compositions that make these composers so great because they do truly create an immersive world and one that many of us grew up in and one that we have so many incredible memories of. But I wanna know from you, what other water levels do you think have a soundtrack that really immerses you in that underwater environment? Let me know in the comments down below. But that's it, that's gonna be all for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you in the next one.